So we're at Stack Overflow right here in Force today. We've got eight people, including me. And so we've got our data engineers, Jason Punyon and Nick Larson. We've got our web devel our developers, uh, Jasu Shin, Ian Allen, Aurelian Gasser. We have a data team lead, Kevin, and my fellow data scientist, Julia Silge, uh, who, yeah, over there, who is, who is also speaking tomorrow. So a lot of us are here, and we want to know, who here has heard of Stack Overflow? <laughs> Often because that is exactly how all of our workflows work, is our, uh, is our typical user might look something like uh, this. Uh, you're about to visit Stack Overflow because you're running into some problem with your code. And then a typical user afterwards would find, go in Stack Overflow and <laughs> pretty excited about what they found. And that includes R. So there have been over 180,000 uh, questions in R on Stack Overflow. And we're going to be able to find out a lot of things about, about people and about our users around the world based on who asks our questions, who answers them, and who visits them. So this gives us a worldwide survey of how people use the R language. So first, let's look at how R has grown over the last, uh, since 2008 when Stack Overflow was founded. We now have 180,000 R questions, but it wasn't always that way. The R tag has grown tremendously over time. Back in the first month, in let me see, it'd be August 2008, there wasn't a single R question. The first one came about six weeks into the existence of the site, how to access the last value in a vector. And it really stayed getting almost no R activity on Stack Overflow for the first year. So that changed, you notice a spike in July 2009. What that came from was a really conscious effort of a Stack Overflow flash mob for the R user community. It was actually called out by the, by the official blog and by the founder, Jeff Atwood, as, be, as being a really productive way to move the, the community forward. And one reason I'm calling that out is you can see for that single day, one person asking a lot of the questions was J.D. Long, who we have here and is going to be speaking later today. So how does R compare? It's been growing so fast, but a lot of things in the data science community are growing as well. Python has grown tremendously, especially since about 2012, and it's still a lot larger than, than R. It's not just data science, but uh, we'll see in a second, a lot of it does cover it. In the meantime, MATLAB has been staying pretty steady and hasn't really been keeping up with R's growth. Julia is not yet a big force in Stack Overflow, so a lot of its activity happens outside of the community of strangers asking questions and getting answers. So right now, so Julia, almost nothing happens in Stack Overflow. It's mostly on mailing lists. So within languages, we also have tags for specific packages. And here we can compare a couple of popular ones. The fastest growing data science package basically anywhere is, Py is Pandas from Python, which was introduced only around 2012, but has grown really quickly since then. NumPy is showing a lot of growth in Python. We do see ggplot2 has, uh, has really been a rather large part, uh, has been growing basically at the same rate as the rest of R. We see da data.table also somewhat large and growing, but dplyr has caught up to, to it in terms of Stack Overflow activity. We look at a couple of technologies outside of Python and R, and we see that, uh, that something like Hadoop, which has been a large part of the ecosystem for a while, has been steadily growing since around 2009. But it's been easily surpassed by Apache Spark, which is a newer big data technology. We see Cassandra hasn't really kept up with it. It still is a smaller part. And TensorFlow grew like a maniac since uh, Google introduced it in 2005. So besides these couple of tags that I'm exploring here, you can go find, your, find how your own favorite programming languages and technologies have been growing based on, uh, based on this tool, Stack Overflow Trends. So now that we're looking at how some of these larger packages and some of these languages have been changing, we might be interested in what kinds of R packages people use in their questions and answers. So this can be gotten from public data. This is the R questions from Stack Overflow data set that we've released on Kaggle. I'll mention it again later, but if you go to kaggle.com slash Stack Overflow, you can download a CSV with all R questions and all R answers. 
And from those, you can examine what packages are used based on uses of library, say library plotly, library ggplot2, or require, or a couple of other similar, uh, similar cases that can show that a package is being used. This allows to say what posts use what packages. The most commonly used package in Stack Overflow history is ggplot2, followed very closely by dplyr, which is impressive since dplyr has been just, catch, just <coughs> introduced much more recently. That's also uh, closely followed by data.table, and these three really kind of stand out. One thing you might notice is of the top 10, I think seven of them are written, are written by Hadley Wickham. You got ggplot2, dplyr, plyr, reshape2, tidyr, stringr, and dev tools. Definitely has an outsized impact on the Stack Overflow R question answer community. We can see what packages have been growing or, uh, or growing then declining or shrinking over time. dplyr, as we saw before, showed rapid growth. Data table has also shown growth. plyr has been dropping since dplyr replaced it. That was Hadley's original data wrangling package. Shiny has been growing like a maniac since it was introduced. Reshape2, another one of Hadley's tools that has been largely supplanted by another tidyr, which is growing. And you can see how these things have generally been uh, increasing and decreasing. We might consider what is used in answers, what's used in questions. This says, what do people recommend to uh, uh, others that, as ways to solve their problems? And those are usually used in answers. One is the split uh, stack shape package is a data ranking package and often uh, suge uh, suggested for this kind, of, uh, this kind of helping people wrangle their data. Micro benchmark allows people to to, uh, to, to compare, for example, the speed of particular solutions. You might not ask it in a question, but you show it in an answer. And we see data wrangling things like data.table, dplyr, uh, per, and tidyr. In terms of more in questions, it's something like caret or leaflet, things that serve a purpose that anyone would want to do, and then they, as they run into issues while they're working on it, they'll ask about it and get help. So we can see that kind of breakdown in packages. You can also say what packages get used together. In particular, what, what tend to appear in answers to the same questions and are therefore the kinds of packages that solve a similar domain of problems. So this is based on a threshold of binary correlations among packages. So we start over here on the left. We see Shiny, Shiny Dashboard, ggviz. Well, that's the cluster for interactive visualization. One kind of interactive visualization is leaflet, which connects to a group with ggmap, maps, raster, sp. This is spatial data and maps in the cluster. We then see it connecting through our color brewer to a general visualization cluster with ggplot2 at the center. We see grid, grid extra, lattice breaking off. That connects the reshape 2 into the data wrangling cluster, which is really the largest out of here. dplyr, data.table, tidyr, per. Per connects through my own broom package to NLME and LME4. We see a connection from per also to web and API work. So we see rvest, xml, httr, xml2. A few other clusters we can uh, track down are reproducibility, r markdown, knitter, xtable. C++ and performance, so we see our CPP uh, gets clustered with our benchmark and micro benchmark. They tend to be used on problems where performance is paramount. The cluster for string manipulation, cluster for uh, machine learning from carrot and random forest, as well as parallelization, which tends to be related. Time series, zoo, cron, lubridate, and see spreadsheets and natural language process, processing, TM and QDAP. So this is a bird's eye view of the landscape of R packages. We get to understand what t ones tend to be used to answer the same kinds of questions. Some of these packages work together. That is, they're complementary. For example, you'll often see ggplot2 and, plot, and the scales package used together. They tend to be used on the same, to, to, solve the same exact problems. We might also imagine competing ones, so ones that tend to appear as answers to the same questions, but different answers. So you wouldn't necessarily use them in combination. You just might use one or the other to solve a particular task. 
So by comparing the, the correlation of ones appearing on the same answer to the rate of them appearing on two different answers to the same problem, we can create an idea of how much do two packages compete versus co uh, co cooperate or complement each other. So the packages, so this means we can show the most Biggest pair of competing packages is data.table and dplyr, and it's not even close. Those tend to be used in two different answers to, the, to someone trying to do the same thing. Similarly, we see tidyr and reshape2. Th those are two by the same person, Hadley, but often uh, allow, offer two different approaches to the same problem. String i and string r, similar. Split stack shape and tidyr. How plot and grid, these are pairs of things where you get, often get an alternative. Sometimes an older one, sometimes and a newer one, sometimes two by different people. But there are ways we can tell that two packages are, are working towards a similar goal. So now we'll talk about where do people use R. And for this, we have to move from public question and answer data to data, to data that we don't share about who visits questions. So we generally have the idea that if you're working in R, you're going to be visiting R questions, and, you're going to, and we can therefore tell your rate in particular parts of the world. Here are the 16 countries with the most stack overflow traffic, and we've lined them up by where the R is the highest and the lowest. Of these 16 countries, the United States, closely followed by Netherlands, have the most R traffic, followed by Australia, United Kingdom. The least our traffic would come from countries like Vietnam, Ukraine, Russia, and India. One trend you might notice of just among these 16 countries is that a lot of richer and first world countries tend to use more R, above, uh, above average rate of R traffic. And, in, uh, and indeed, that's true. You see a country's usage of R is correlated with GDP. So you get Switzerland up at the top with very high GDP and one of the highest rates of R usage. You get Vietnam and Pakistan, Ukraine, Indonesia, Egypt with lower GDP per capita and less R usage. My general suspicion with this is that it's, uh, though I don't really have the, the data to back it up, is that this is mostly related to rates of PhDs within a country. So areas where there are scientists, graduate students, and, and yeah, generally academic work as opposed to other kinds of programming. So India does have a ton of programming. It just tends to be in uh, Java, Android, PHP, and other types of work. So I missed a second ago. We have a map of the world. And here you can really see that difference between European countries, Ca uh, Canada, United States, Australia, so the first world English-speaking world, and areas where there's less R activity, and generally more things like Android and PHP. One interesting question is what other things might be correlated with, with GDP? And we really see, in fact, it's really R and ggplot2 way at the top of this is the correlation between a country's GDP and how much they visit a tag. It's all about R and ggplot2, and it's much less about Android. Uh, and the uh, anti-correlate is Android. We also get Facebook, a couple other areas in there. It's one trend we see whenever we look across countries. How about across US states? Here you see that, the, that largely there's sort of a division of northeast and southwest states in terms of how much they use R. We'll get to the exception over there uh, in the Midwest in a moment. So you really have Massachusetts, which is really a result of large amounts of research and academic work. Uh, Washington, D.C., which is too small to see here, uh, has, a, uh, t has a ton of it. Um, and we have really, and New York does have some as well. California, much less. That's just because most programmers in California, they'll, they'll tend to work in, uh, in say, tech companies uh, that might have web products and would, have, would focus less on data science, or, you, or actually do use Python. Two states, what is this, Montana and Wyoming. Yeah, uh, Montana and Wyoming have a very high rate, and the main reason is both that they're very small states, though still more than a million visits in the year we looked at, and they have large universities. And that gets to, to another question is, how does R differ by industry? We were able to divide up Stack Overflow traffic from the US based on its IP address. We identify from IP address to companies and from companies to, uh, to common industries. So, and here we say, how much of each industry's traffic goes towards R? 
by a large margin, it's academic. It's really researchers. And certainly, yeah, grad school is where I, I learned art. So you get uh, universities, followed closely by healthcare. So it's a combination of hospitals, health research uh, areas, government, that's one of the reasons that, uh, that DC is, is high, consulting, and much less in tech and uh, electronics and manufacturing and in the tech sector at companies like Apple or Google. You really just uh, see less R than elsewhere. So we can see one difference. We can also see a difference in how fast they're growing. So this is how much do they change in their year-over-year -year change from 2015 to 2016, how much did R traffic increase? And increased by a, the fastest growing sector that R uh, in the industry where R is the fastest growing is consulting. R traffic went up by about 40% during that time. It, it's also growing in government, and it's already pretty small in manufacturing, but it is growing there. And really, it is becoming more popular relative to other languages and technologies across the entire, the entire corporate sector. Took a look, closer look at universities, because those are really interesting. And I took a look at universities that ask the most R questions relative to other technologies. And the, within the United States, this is of um, universities with at least 200 people that ask questions. We have Yale, Duke, and University of Chicago leading up in, United, in the United States, University of Warwick and University of College London leading up in the United Kingdom. And if you take a look, uh, deeper look into these, it tends to be a breakdown of research institutions versus ones with large undergraduate colleges. Makes sense because graduate students tend to be more likely to use R than someone in an undergraduate course. You can see a lot more about that at a blog post I wrote in February. It is called, How Do, Do Students Use Stack Overflow? And we took a little look across six different languages, and we saw that ones like Java and C, where they tend to be taught in undergraduate classes, you see a seasonal effect of they're used a lot in the spring, visit a lot in the spring and the fall. But something like R and MATLAB, it's pretty consistent throughout the year. So that's one way we can tell, we can confirm our hypothesis that R usage is mostly among graduate students. There's other blog posts we've written in the last couple of months about what we can tell from Stack Overflow data. One that came out just Wednesday is when during the day do Stack Overflow users visit particular technologies? And we have an interactive Shiny app uh, that you can get to from the blog. And it shows is the trend of you get at nighttime, spikes in the morning, spikes in the evening, and how much people use it in the evenings. And I compare it to a very 9 to 5 technology C sharp, as well as a very evening heavy technology C. And the truth is R is basically in the middle. R is, a, is maybe a bit shifted towards working from 9 to 5. I didn't necessarily expect that, because I, might, I would think it might be used by students and other people that would, that would tend to work in the evening. But yeah, it looks like R, people that use R often do use it from 9 to 5. So I've done a lot of analyses here, and a lot of them might interest you, and you might want to dive in further. If you want to analyze it yourself, we make a lot of open data available. So one would be, uh, I already mentioned, on Kaggle, we have kaggle.com slash stack overflow, where I've shared a number of easily downloadable and analyzable CSV files with all R questions, all Python questions, all cross-validated questions, our statistics site. That's an easy way to go in, uh, go and dive into those problems. We also have the Stack Exchange Data Explorer. This is really amazing, and the company's had it for a couple of years, and it's a, it's a way to run SQL queries on our database, just with the anonymous data blocked out. You can go and, just, and put whatever type of group by and, and summarize and select that you might be interested in and find out some things about how people ask and answer on the site. We also have an API, the Stack Exchange API, and an R package that I'm responsible for on GitHub for pulling data from it. That's really good for grabbing, for, for doing a particular search or grabbing a particular user. And if you really want everything that we release, we do release one enormous data dump with uh, all of the posts, questions, answers, users, everything in one large XML file every couple of months. So if you want to dive into like, some really large, interesting data analysis, that's really a good place to go. If you'd rather not analyze the data yourself, but you'd rather have us do it for you, we have Stack Overflow Insights. That's our consulting arm where we'll actually go through, analyze our traffic data, and answer questions just like the ones that I've been showing so that you can help your business. Thank you. <laughs>